Well, hello everyone to this keynote speech. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce our keynote speaker, Professor Adam Porter. Professor Porter is a highly regarded member of the software engineering community. Let me just give you a few uh, hints about his extensive CV. Since 1991, Dr. Porter has been a professor of computer science at the University of Maryland and the University of Maryland Institute for Advanced Studies. He also serves as the executive and scientific director of the Fraunhofer USA Center Mid-Atlantic. Dr. Porter is an award-winning teacher and researcher. He's a winner of the US National Science Foundation Faculty uh, Early Career Development Award and a winner of multiple teaching awards. His current research focuses on application and implementation of AI-driven software systems, and his, his work has been supported by major government and private sector organizations, including Google or IBM, among others. Dr. Porter has run one of the world's largest massive online open courses on mobile applications development for the Android platform. Uh, let me tell you that this course ha has had over 1 million student registration for, uh, from over 200 countries, which is really, really impressive. And more importantly, I would like to highlight that Dr. Porter, Michael Limbaugh, and their team had participated in all the editions of the MET series, presenting papers and attending the workshops. And therefore, they are a very important part of our community. They have made very significant contributions. That's why we are so happy, we are thrilled of having uh, Dr. Porter here today to, you know, to share his reflections and his experience with us. So that, that's all, the floor is yours, uh, Professor Porter. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So uh, my first my first um, met conference that I that I went to personally was in uh, 2017 in Buenos Aires, and um, I went I went to the to the workshop and I and I um, uh, during one of the breaks I stepped out into the uh, into the hallway and was milling around with with uh, various you know people, and uh, somebody who I will call the jerk you know, comes to me and he says, hey, you know, Adam, how is it going? What what workshop are you attending? And I said, oh, you know, I'm over at the, the MET workshop. And then the jerk, you know, looks at me, kind of snickers a little bit and says, oh, you mean the sine cosine stuff? And this is my first, you know, my first, uh, you know, event at the, the MET workshop. And I thought, well, what are you talking about? I mean, it's it's certainly more than that. I don't understand what you're what you're saying to me. You know, but but the thing is, meeting a jerk at a software engineering research conference, that's not really a rare event, as I think we all know. Um, you know, so so that part I, I could leave aside, but but the, but the conversation kind of stuck with me a little bit, and I thought, well, what what can I learn from that, right? What what was this person saying to me? Why are they saying this? You know, what is what does this mean? And so I thought about it for a while, and, and after and and I you know I, I I reflected on it. You know, what what can I take away from this interaction? What can I learn? You know, learn from this. And uh, so, so part of that has helped to help me to think a little bit about what, what, what I'm going to talk about today. So first of all, let's let's talk a little bit about, about metamorphic testing. So we're just sort of to make sure we're all talking about the same thing. If we if we go back to you know the early you know uh, paper by Chen et al. in '98, we, we see a process that looks something you know something like what I've shown here, and and the process has has pretty much stayed with us over the last 20 plus years. So the notion here, uh, you know, as originally uh, conceived was. We're running tests, uh, and, and some of those tests pass. So we, we have a, a test case. We create it or we select it, and we'll call that test case X. We give it to the system under test, the SUT, and we get some output. And then we're going to evaluate that output, right? Is it correct? Is it not correct? And then the idea is, OK, let's suppose that the, 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 um, the, the, um, the output is correct, right? We have a test case that passed. OK, well, what else can we do with this? So we take this test case. And we we construct something called the metamorphic relation, an MR, and we say, okay, well, this this um, metamorphic relation allows me to take the past test, uh, the test that passed, and and, and generate one or more follow-on test cases, additional test cases that are related to the original source test case. So let's just make this simple. We have one test case, and we're going to call that G of X. We take G of X and we push it right back through the same system under test, and we get the output. And now we don't we don't need an we don't need an oracle to evaluate the output of g of x. What we do is we compare the output of g of x to the output of the original x, and then we apply some sort of evaluation function in order to decide you know this test is uh, consistent with what we know or it's inconsistent with what we know. Okay, and the the benefits you know the the, the benefits that this process should confer 
were uh, described in the following way. So Chen and all they say, well, first of all, if we if we have a test case that passes, we don't have to stop there. We can get additional value out of that, right? And we can use these MRs to effectively amplify the past test case and to generate more value out of that. And those amplified test cases, they argue, will find additional bugs. So we, we get value out of, uh, of the test case, we amplify it, we find additional bugs. And, and another important value is that because we know the original, we have an oracle, an oracle for the original test case, and we know how to evaluate the, the new test case, you know, given the old test case, I don't need to, to create an oracle for the brand new test case. So there, are, there should be some cost savings and some, some applicability of this approach in situations where it's very difficult to construct, to construct an oracle. So that was the way that the, the, the original process was, was constructed. Okay, now stepping back for a second, going back to the original conversation, you know, with, with the jerk, um, you know, it's, it, 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 you know, I, I've been around, I've been doing this for a while, and basically fields, topics within a field, approaches to, to research, go through a life cycle, right? They go through times when they are, are more accepted, they go through times when they're less accepted. Now that in and of itself isn't really, um, isn't really, um, uh, unusual or odd, right? But for example, you know, most people don't remember this, but databases was considered a really non-scientific field at one point. AI went through difficulties where it was very popular and then very, uh, it was very much, you know, uh, um, looked down upon for many years. The whole software engineering field has gone through these kinds of kinds of areas, and in software testing, you know, itself has has gone from a, a time of of low acceptance to now where you know many many of the papers we see in ICSI have uh, are, are focused on testing of various sorts so so what is it that that drives the acceptance of fields right because you know i think um what 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 that person was telling me right even though i disagree with their their point and i thought it was kind of lazy is that our field has not really been accepted right we we haven't really had the the acceptance that we want for this field right and so some of the complaints that you see, you know, not for our, not just for our field, but for all of them, you know, are people say, well, you know, uh, I don't like a field or I don't like an approach or, or a topic because it's not really academic enough, right? It lacks, it lacks the depth, you know, the, the non-obvious uh, 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 formulations and tools that allow me to, to, to give me great power to solve a problem. Uh, the people will argue that it has lim limited generalizability. If I have to create sort of one-off uh, solutions every time I apply a, a technique, then it doesn't really give me a great lever for for solving problems, right? It's it's, it's use, useful for a very small amount of problems, but not for a big set of problems, which is what we'd really like. Uh, and then ultimately, at the end of the day, if you if you don't have you know this, the, you don't have powerful tools, and you don't have generalizability, you're going to have limited practical success. Okay, and 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 um, you know I think that at the end of the day, you know uh, our field, any field becomes accepted when it has practical success, right? So as the value and the impact of a field become clearer, become you know, inarguable, then acceptance will, will automatically follow, okay? And uh, so let me try to, try to sort of just simplify this. You know, I think that our, our field you know, and, and has not had the success that it merits, has not had the success that it deserves, and not, it doesn't have the success that we would like for it. Uh, to me, that means you know it's not a it's not a marketing problem. It's not that we haven't made our uh, made our pitch to the world, right? It's that we haven't had enough success to to get people you know attracted and, and following on onto our on, onto our field. And so that's a challenge for us, right? Uh, we need we need to we need to think about what can we do to fix that problem, right, or to address that problem. And so I would argue that to be more successful. You know, as a research community, you know, we need to do a couple things. We need to grow the community. We need to bring more people into the into our field right we need to broaden and deepen our ideas and our ecosystem right you know that we know there's we need to have new novel interesting thoughts and approaches we need to grow the, the range of things that we try and do and we need to build an ecosystem that supports people right we need we need all the tools and the foundational uh capabilities so it's easy to do research in this in this space it's easy to port this to uh, industrial problems so that we have more so we have more success and i think as we you know then we need to unambiguously demonstrate this impact okay and so this is the challenge that sits in front of us and this is the challenge that i want to talk about today so um you know, i'm adam porter as as, as sergio said I'm, I'm a professor of computer science at the university of maryland I have appointments in the University of Maryland Institute for Advanced Computing Studies, the Institute for Systems Research, uh, the Applied Research Laboratory for Intelligence and Security. I'm the executive director of the Frano for USA Center in Mid-Atlantic. 
Uh, and I've been a professor at the University of Maryland for 30, uh, 30 years this year. All right, so I've been doing this for a while and I've seen, I've seen fields grow and shrink and change over time. And I wanna come to this problem and I wanna be really clear here. Um, what I'm saying might sound a little critical, but, it, but it's not. It's, it's, what I wanna be is, um, is, is probing. I want to be. I want to be constructive, right? And I want to open a conversation with the community. We we like what we do. We think we've got some powerful ideas. How do we do more? How do we how do we uh, have more impact, right? How do we enjoy the benefits of all this hard work uh, that we're that we're uh, that we're involved in? And that's really my goal for today. And I hope to to encourage you to join in the discussion uh, and to and to to give your own ideas and your own thoughts to to push back against what I'm saying, but but to think of this in a really constructive uh, way. Uh, my goal is not to criticize. My goal is to grow and to, to help um, to push our field forward. So in this talk today, like I said, I want to start a conversation. Uh, I've talked a little bit about what I think is the state of the community. Uh, and then I want to shift gears a little bit now going forward. And I want to talk about if, you know, if our goal is really to, 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 to have more impact, to be, you know, to, 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 to grow our, our innovation capability, then I think it's, a, it's good to step back and ask, well, where does in it, where do good ideas come from? And I'll talk specifically about a, an interesting book that I've recently read uh, called, called, in fact, Where Do Good Ideas Come From? And, um, and, and we'll, we'll look at sort of what, what, you know, what are the characteristics of, of strong, innovative ecosystems, right? And then we'll, and I'll try to offer some ideas of my own on how, how we can, you know, uh, with respect to those, those concepts, how do we, how do we uh, have some impact? How do we move forward? Okay. And then hopefully we'll have some time at the end to wrap up and have some discussion together. So, the, so let's talk about this book, uh, where, where Good Ideas Come From, The Natural History of Innovation. So just some, some quotes that come from the book. A good idea is a network, right? An idea isn't a single thing all by itself. It's, it's, a, it's a bunch of concepts and thoughts tied together, interlocked together, um, and it's a growing and living kind of thing. Okay? It's, it's a network. So they say good ideas are not conjured out of thin air. They're built out of a collection of existing parts. It, uh, the point here is that innovation is practical. Innovation needs implementation. Implement, you know, good. Um, you know, innovation needs success, right? It's not about it's not about things written on paper. It's about practical problems and implementations and problems solved in real life. Okay, and you know, they don't come from uh, quantum leaps. Uh, I mean, most innovation doesn't come from quantum leaps in thinking. It comes from hard you know, incremental, you know, building upon the work of others and growing the, the value proposition, you know, over time. And then finally, uh, they, they, they use a quote from Henri Poincaré, uh, the French mathematician, and he says, ideas rise in crowds. And again, there's a, there's a very social nature to innovation, uh, one that I think we need, we need to think about a little bit. How do we, you know, how do we get them? You know, it's not just one person, you know, who happens to see farther than everybody else. It's, it's, the, it's the community. It's, it's the, the, the people working together, sharing ideas, pushing together uh, that really drive a community forward. So going into the book, you know, uh, Johnson talks about something he calls the long zoom. If we, take a, if we take a look at innovation over a long period of time, we see certain characteristics of innovation that show up over and over again. Uh, one one interesting point, and this has been remarked on in, in many different fields, but it routinely takes 20 years to develop mass markets for a given technology. It doesn't happen overnight. It takes you know 10 years to build up an idea, 10 years to find a mass a mass market. Uh, most innovation, as I said, happens incrementally. Uh, you know the days of sort of overturning complete you know scientific thought in a field are, are probably over. You know given the given the strong the strong scientific uh, approaches that we use today, uh, we're not going to find things you know, a thousand percent, you know, 180 degrees different from what other people are finding. We want to build on, right, and, and, and grow the, the capabilities more than, more than think about overturning, you know, approaches. And then finally, it's a social process, density, co openness, connectivity, you know, things that generate more effort, more interactions, more competition of ideas uh, is more, valued to, uh, more valuable to innovation than just purely, and in this case, I mean, financially competitive mechanisms. If I, if I try to hold all my ideas close so that I get all the credit, um, I'm probably in the long run, you know, uh, not optimizing for, for the growth of the community, even if I think I'm optimizing for from, from my, own, my own financial gain. And so we, we, wanna, we wanna think about that and, and try to, to open up what we're doing, share more, uh, collaborate more because that's really the road to the fastest road to innovation. 
So Johnson talks about seven drivers of innovation, and I'm going to go through each of these, you know, just, just very quickly. Uh, one, he talks about the adjacent possible, liquid networks, the slow hunch, serendipity, error, exaptation, and platforms. And I'm going to come back, you know, through all of these, you know, one at a time. Um, so the first one, the adjacent possible, uh, you know, the idea here is that innovation follows a greedy algorithm, okay? Uh, you know, the world at any point is, is capable of, of, of changing in many different interesting ways, but, but at any, any given moment, probably only a couple of those changes are really practical. Only a couple of those changes can actually happen and solve a problem. And so the, the, oops, the scientist Kaufman calls this, this, this area, this frontier, right, around the border of our, of our field where we can make progress. He calls that the adjacent possible, okay? And in fact, if you think about it, you know, sort of by definition, then practical innovations, you know, can only be found in this adjacent possible. If, if this, you know, red area is the, you know, the, 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 where we are today, it's, it's only right here around the edges, right, that we can take the next step. And so we ought to be looking at that next step and figuring out how do we, how do we take it? How do we make sure that next step is really good and interesting? Uh, to give you to give you an example of uh, a counter example or not not a counter example but an, an example of the opposite of this um you know very often as researchers you know we want to shock the world we want to want to believe that we've um we found you know the the new way to see things okay uh, but there's a danger in that right uh, so here's an exa uh, example i think as computer scientists many of us have heard of charles babbage who sometimes you know we think of as the father or the grandfather of computing but in, 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 19, in 1837, he designed on paper something that he called the analytical engine, right? And this would have been the world's first programmable computer. This is 1837, okay? It's like, um, what is that, 160 years ago. But we know from the way that history then shook out that it took about 100 years to develop even rudimentary programmable, programmable, uh, programmable computers, okay? So this guy had this great idea. You know, he saw farther than anyone else at the time. In fact, he created an electronic age design for a steam engine world, okay? And the point was that because his idea was so far ahead of its time, it was impossible to implement it. They did not have the technology to make that idea real, okay? And they, uh, um, you know, and because of that, you know, you can say that the Babbage saw far, he was, he was a genius, let's say, uh, but the idea had almost no practical impact. And if we really wanna have practical impact, we're going to have to pull back a little bit, right? And not look so far out, but try to figure out where we can make progress today. Um, and so some, some thoughts here, they say, we, you know, we really want to think about our work practices and how we do things, where we really want to focus on defining the boundaries of our field. What can we do today? What are we good at, right? What can't we do today? Exploring, and then, and then explore the edges around of possibility that surround that boundary. Okay, so if I can't do X, how do I start to get that? How do I start to, to take that next step, right? Um, and so they, um, they talk about, you know, we want to identify concepts in particular from different fields and think about novel ways of recombining them. Creativity is often about <clears throat> finding things that are just, you know, that we hadn't thought about before, right? Because they were, they were somewhere else and, and bringing them into our arsenal of technologies. So we want to think about changing our work environment and our processes, creating new ways to find and combine information, uh, especially from different domains and cultivating and activating our social networks. I'm gonna talk more about these in a, in a second. But, but from, from my perspective, some suggestions I think we can, we can think about for, for the MET community. Uh, first of all, from my perspective, everybody I talk to wants more artificial intelligence. Every, you know, everywhere I work as you know, in my applied research capability, uh, everybody wants artificial intelligence and they're afraid of it. Okay. They, they want it, but they don't know they, they can trust it. Okay. And I, this is a problem that's that for the, for which the Oracle problem is, is inherent in AI. And, you know, in fact, if you look at the workshop uh, um, uh, schedule today, we have people talking about, about this area, right? It, so, so I'm not the only one who's seen this, but I think we need to push on this very, very hard. I think we need to make this a priority as a community. Uh, for example, 2020, there was a great paper by Jarman et al about using, you know, AI to learn MRs. I think we need a lot more work in that space. Uh, 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 domain-specific languages for specifying MRs and, and, and generating them quickly. I think there's a huge uh, area of, of room for metamorph what I'll call metamorphic analysis. So less testing and more metamorphosis, focusing on how the, the, the metamorphic concept gives us a secondary input, a secondary signal that we can use in different ways. Uh, I think we should be looking for new objectives for testing, things like maybe non-functional things like bias and unfairness that are uh, very interesting and, and very much of, of interest today when we're using AI. 
to make decisions about, about human processes. Uh, thinking about you know metamorphic testing in new places like in the, in the in the generation of bots for for establishing or evaluating trust in human AI teams and these are just a couple of my examples there there are many many more that we can that we can look at and I hope we'll have some of those discussions today so let me let me push forward a little bit I'll speed up a little bit on these now liquid networks so again we go, we go this idea that ideas are a network right it's not just one thing it's a combination of of concepts and ideas. Uh, you know, our innovation is going to accelerate in, in what they call it, what Johnson calls a liquid network. So our, our ideas need lots of elements, lots of concepts, lots of connections, lot, you know, very dense, you know, activity. We, we want to make sure that, that these elements can be, uh, can make connections to other elements quickly, right? That's the liquid or plastic nature of the network. And then what we, we want to be able to take these, these concepts and, and, you know, you know, bang them together with each other and see how they can be um, combined and, and modified and adapted to create new concepts, right? And if our innovation engine allows us to do that, we're going to see we're going to see faster and faster innovation. So, give an example here. There's a, a researcher named Kevin Dunbar who had studied the process of innovation. He went into he and his team. They went into a, a molecular biology lab, and they basically followed the, these scientists around and they they tracked how information flowed through the lab. And one of the analyses is one of the analyses that they looked at was you know where did breakthroughs happen. So in retrospect, once they saw that there was a, a step forward, they went back to their notes and said, where did it come from? How did it, how did it, how did it grow? And what they found out was that isolated breakthrough moments were quite rare. Most of the important ideas really came out of uh, uh, the most important place was in lab meetings. So these researchers would get together every week, they would share their ideas, they would present things, uh, they would question each other and discuss their work. And this was the number one place where people identified you know, uh, well, did you think about this? Why did you do that? You know, couldn't you have done this? You know, are you sure that that data means what you think it means? And this is where this is really the greatest engine of, um, of innovation. And so, you know, again, they they say let's focus on this this social nature to innovation. The most productive tool for generating good ideas is just people getting together, sitting down, having a cup of coffee, uh, you know, having a spirited debate about something, right? And and and, and bouncing ideas off each other. And these group conversations, you know, they, they function to turn individual insights and, and thoughts, you know, and conjectures into this liquid network, right? So they, they give us new ways to look at things we hadn't looked at before and to push forward. And I would say that one of the, the, the things that stops us the most from really doing this is a desire to preserve ownership and credit. We often want to hold things close so we get all the credit for our, you know, our, our ideas. Uh, I think this is this this you know might work for an individual, but I don't think it optim optimizes for the community. So some suggestions for Met. I think you know um, when we look around the community, uh, we've got lots of, of of really smart, interesting people, but I don't think we have enough uh, enough people and enough diversity, enough people coming from different areas. It'd be great for us to think about things like dog stool type workshops where we we find people interested in this problem and we 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 go away for a week and try to figure out how you know interesting challenges. Uh, we need to look at creating more proposals, right? Uh, collaborative proposals. Uh, for example, this week, Mark Harmon talked about uh, an opportunity from Facebook, and I know we have some representation from um, metamorphic testing from last year's winners, but I think we could do more. Maybe we can bring some different concepts and ideas together. Defining grand challenge problems, sponsoring competitions, right? Uh, you, you think about uh, you know, the, the MSR workshop for mining software repositories started as a way for people who are interested in this mining concept to get together and try stuff out. What would what would be a similar kind of concept for you know the a metamorphic you know testing, metamorphic analysis, you know, problem that we could all work on, you know, to try to, to look at together. You know, maybe studying a big uh, open AI system and, and figuring out how we could, you know, what would interesting metamorphic things could we do for a for a big system like that. Uh, also looking for ways to sh to have people move between labs, uh, supporting postdoctoral opportunities and things like that. Next concept they talked about was called the, the slow hunch. So again, you know, I've said this before, as researchers, we wanna, we wanna be farsighted. We wanna be the guy that, that you know, figured out gravity existed, right? Or, or you know, like, like you know, Archimedes, we wanna understand how do I measure, uh, how do I measure weight you know, or density of objects when I can't, you know, when I don't have a, a, you know, initially a way to do that. So we wanna have these eureka moments where we, where we saw something. But, but the truth is, and I'm sure if we look back in our own, each of us looks back in our own lives, it, probably most of our ideas didn't really come as these, you know, blinding insights in a, in a flash of lightning or something. But they they arrived as hunches. Okay, they uh, by hunches I mean there was a bit of an insight, 
but missing some elements, right? And so we got this initial thought and we think, how do I, how do I turn that into something good, right? How do I add to that to make it really have value and impact? Um, and, and one thing that we, we often miss is that the, the parts that are missing in our hunches may exist in somebody else's head, right? What we need to do is we need to get our hunches together with their hunches so we can bring them together. And again, that's why this concept of like a liquid network really helps because it's like it's like speed dating for for ideas, right? We want to bring our ideas together, find out where they have some some commonality, complementarity, uh, challenge each other, you know, whatever it is, and then use those to build even greater ideas. And of course, you know, the point is that that process takes some time and it takes some work. We've got to get out there and, and do that together. They use an example here from uh, uh, Darwin, um, Charles Darwin, you know, who um, spent time on a, on a ship, the, uh, the HMS Beagle, traveling around the, the, the Americas. Uh, and he was a naturalist. He was looking at animals and, and, and you know, plants and, and really studying things in, in great depth. And he had a lot of questions that he was looking, looking at. One of the things he, he ran into uh, on the Galapagos was this, um, the fact there are all these different kinds of birds. They, they were all finches. They were all a particular type of bird, but they but many, many different species with different beaks and all kinds of things. And, and he was saying, well, you know, why do we have so many kinds of finches? How does that happen, right, in this island? And he wrote in his diary, you know, he said, I happened to read for amusement Malthus on population. So Malthus was a, a scientist who talked about population dynamics. Um, and, you know, you, you, animals are, are doing well. They get a lot, lot of food. You know, they, get to, they have lots of babies. And then there's too many animals for the, for the, for the environment. And there's a crash in the population, and this this sort of cycle happens back and forth. Um, and Darwin was reading this, and he says, you know, I, you know, being well prepared to appreciate the struggle for existence, which everywhere goes on from long continued observation of the habits of uh, plants and animals. So he's like, I see this. I see, you know, plants. You know, I see these 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 um, animal communities struggling and for existence and doing different things. And sometimes they're they're successful, and sometimes they're not. Uh, and he says, and it struck me at once under these circumstances that favorable variations would tend to be preserved and unfavorable ones to be destroyed. The result of this would be the formation of a new species. Here then I had at last got a theory by which to work. And so basically this is essentially his natural selection idea. He's found it in the midst of this. And it still took him many years after he wrote this to fully understand what he meant. But the point was the idea, right, the, the thing he was missing, the theory he needed was somewhere else. And once, when he was able to come together with that, all of a sudden he had a way to, to go forward and something to think about. Uh, so we want to we nurture our slow hunches, right? We want to keep those hunches alive by writing them down, by revisiting them pro, uh, periodically. And we importantly, we need to disseminate these hunches through our, our liquid networks. And we need to try to find ways to, to connect and test you know, our, our, these, I, these hunches as they come together. Okay, so we, we, need, we need something active in which we try out different ideas and test them and evaluate them. Did they work? Or didn't they work? So some suggestions for Matt. So to me, this is just, again, this is just my hunch, right? I, I think um, that the, the way we think about metamorphic testing, like that picture I showed you on, the, on, on slide two, uh, I think it's, it's too much, right? I think it's overly restrictive, all right? I think there's a lot of stuff in there that isn't really, you know, necessary to the, to, the, to the power of, of metamorphic testing. And I think you can boil this down. I think metamorphic testing just takes inputs and projects them onto an output space, okay? We then take an evaluation function and we say, okay, I've got you know, two or more outputs. Are they sufficiently related for whatever purpose that I'm, that I'm interested? To me, that's all, that's all metamorphic testing really is. It's that, that fundamental activity. And so I think you know, that, that gives us new ways to think about what we can do with metamorphic testing, with metamorphic analysis, I'll call it. So, um, you know, for example, I, I love this idea that software systems, you know, are analogous to living things, right? We can think they're, they're you know, they're, they're, they're living over time and they, can, they, they may have things like vital signs. We can be able to monitor their health, right? And so, for example, I, I think metamorphic analysis is, is really about monitoring data and detecting anomalies. And any way we can do that, uh, is, is, is a powerful thing that should be studied in, in, our, in our community. I think, um, you know, a focus on, on formal, explicit MRs uh, is, is slow and, 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 and hard to generalize. I think maybe empirically derived, learned, or probabilistic MRs may be the right way to go. And I know there's a paper on this later uh, today in this workshop. Uh, 
Also, I think we can project and, and we can take inputs and we can generate projections from more than just the inputs to the system and the outputs to the system. We can get inside the system. We can do the same concepts for internal states, neural network, you know, neurons for coverage metrics, for all kinds of different things that we can use to compare and contrast and see what, what is the normal behavior of the system and when does it deviate from normal, right? Because then we can make decisions on that. Um, you know, metamorphic analysis, I think, can play a strong role in, in, mon in, in runtime, right? I think, I think, again, the more, more metamorphosis, less testing, you know, I think, I think this gives us a way, you know, to, to speculate about the health of the system and maybe then enact, you know, immune system activities to, 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 to modify the system or change its behavior, things like that. Uh, you know, I, uh, if we put this together with the AI, the concept of really focusing on AI systems, you know, maybe we can give intelligence tests to AI systems, right? To understand, you know, are, are, you know, are they still smart? Are they learning, right? Uh, uh, you know, what's going on with the system? So I, I think there's, there's a lot of room for very powerful ideas within this MET framework. Uh, and again, these are just some of my thoughts and, and, I, and I hope that people will expand on these or, or, or destroy them or change them or whatever it is, uh, because I think there's more that we can do and we just have to get out of a, a very fixed way of thinking about, about our work. Um, some other concepts, you know, other, other aspects of innovation, serendipity, okay? So the, this word serendipity was created by a man named Horace Walpole uh, back in the 1800s. And it was based on a Persian um, fairy tale called the Three Princes of Serendip. Who were you know always making discoveries by accident and sagacity of things they were not in quest of. They would fall upon you know interesting information you know by accident. He says you don't reach Serendip, the, uh, the island of Serendip. You don't reach Serendip by plotting a course for it. You have to set out in good faith for elsewhere and lose your bearings. Okay, and the the point here is that the, the shortest path to innovation lies in making novel connections. We have to go to places we haven't thought of. We have to you know, arrive at concepts that we uh, that were weird and strange and bizarre, right? I mean, this this is how we how we innovate, not by taking safe paths of just you know following the you know the the normal the normal sorts of things. Uh, give an example here. They talk about this uh, this water uh, flea called the the Daphnia magna. So it lives in freshwater ponds and swamps. Uh, and typically, these uh, uh, these Daphne are female. They're all female, <clears throat> and they pr they reproduce asexually. So they they basically effectively make clones of themselves, and they just keep you know keep multiplying and multiplying, and, and everything goes great. That's when when times are good. But when there's uh, some ecological stress, right? Uh, when when there isn't enough water, enough food, they actually then start to produce males, and they reproduce sexually. And, you know, and what's the point? The point is that when the world gets challenging, you need to innovate, right? So sexual reproduction has error in it, right? It has uh, some uh, combinations of different, you know, different characteristics from the male and the female, and you arrive at, you know, uh, a different organism than you started with that might be uh, more, more capable of surviving in this challenging world. And so we need that in our research as well. We need to, we need to have ways of creating, you know, happy accidents that, 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 that leave us at, at, a, at a better situation. So we want to create work environments that favor serendipity. We want to build information networks that allow the, our hunches to persist and disperse and recombine through the community. We want to do this at multiple scales within our own ideas, within our, within our, you know, within our institutions, across our research community. Um, you know, and we want to play more. We want to try more things, right? We want to make mistakes. Uh, and we want to, you know, be curious. We want to ask questions of each other. And what I've heard are called a, a beautiful questions. Why? Why did you do that? Why do you think that that's the right way to go? Why do you interpret that data to mean this? Why? Why didn't you do X, Y, or Z? Right. Getting back to the to the whys of all this stuff will help us to to push, you know, um, you know, to push our our, our uh, field forward. So some suggestions, and we don't have time to do this now, but I stole an idea from. Uh, uh, Michael Ernst uh, was at the University of Washington when <clears throat> um, he said, you know, he would do this, which is to uh, start by, you know, n thinking of some traditional, you know, software engineering activity, writing requirements, right? Um, uh, you know, ge uh, code generation, right? Whatever, whatever it is, some, some, some software engineering activity. And then the next step was, you know, he was doing it for something else. So I, I've adapted this, but come up with a metamorphic analog to this activity. How would, how would metamorphic concepts help in requirements generation? It's a question. I don't know, right? How would they help in code generation? How would they help, or how would it be, you know, useful in um, a regression testing? How would it be, you know, useful for code optimization or performance, you know, monitoring? Uh, and and you know, where where would this metamorphic concept allow us to get more value? 
Uh, so again, I, I, I'll just leave this here to say like, you know, it's, it's an interesting experiment to try out sometime because it might find us ways to connect our, our topic to other parts of the software engineering field. So it's not just, you know, us doing our metamorphic testing thing, but us having a concept that's of value to, to other communities as well. And that might attract other people into our field and allow us to, to do more in, in their field, right? So I would love to see, for example, you know, I would love to see several metamorphic, you know, testing conce concepts appear at the main ICSI uh, 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 conference, right? Which I haven't seen so much of. Okay, so these are some of the challenges we wanna, wanna think about as community and how to, how to do something there. Next uh, uh, um, characteristic of innovation is error. So, you know, the, you know, productivity, what they're saying here, there's some studies that say productivity correlates, is positively correlated with radical breakthroughs. So in other words, quantity leads to quality, right? That's, that sounds like a very crazy thing to think, to think about. But, uh, you know, most of the people I know who are very successful researchers uh, also have a ton of failures, right? They have lots of papers accepted because they had lot, because they wrote lots of papers and they had lots of them in, in, in the process. They got lots that were rejected, okay? But they've been busy. They're, they're, they're trying lots of things. They're doing lots of work. It's very rare to see somebody who's got, you know, an Einstein who wrote six papers or, you know, whatever it is in their life, three of which got a Nobel Prize, right? That's, that's not a very common uh, thing. Most of the people who are, who are very um, uh, successful have a lot of activity going on there, right? They're trying lots of things, they're, they're doing lots of things, and bit by bit they, they accumulate, they aggregate success over time, right? And one of the, um, so we wanna see, you know, they, they say your good ideas are more likely to emerge in environments that have some noise and some error, right? So we, we're trying things and sometimes it, it works and sometimes it doesn't, and sometimes that error gives us an insight into a way to move forward. <clears throat> so we wanna, you know, really think about, you know, not stopping when we see an error, but how do we turn, you know, error into, into insight, right? Uh, give an example here, the, the, the birth of the transistor. So there was a gentleman, I think he was in Chicago, named Lee, Lee DeForest. He was a radio enthusiast in the early 1900s. And so he had a thing called the spark gap machine, which was a, you know, something you use to generate a spark so you can get the clicks like in Morse code, click, 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 or, you know, whatever it is. He was experimenting with this machine. So when he was what he noticed was, like, I guess it was, a, it was an evening or something, it was dark, he had a gas flame in his, in his apartment that was giving light, and when he would, when he would hit this, this spark gap machine thing, he saw that the, the flame would change color. Now, every time he generated the spark, the, 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 the flame would change color, and he thought, wow, the, the, the gas is detecting electrical energy. This is amazing, he thought, right? Now, it turns out he was completely wrong. Right, and it took years for them for people to discover he, that he was was wrong and why he was wrong. Uh, but they they worked. He worked, and others worked feverishly to figure out. You know, how do we how do we use this gas concept to amplify electrical energy to detect electrical energy? Um, and then in, in the process of doing this, they 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 said, oh, we need to encapsulate the gas in you know, low pressure gas in a tube. That was sort of the beginnings of the vacuum tube. Vacuum tubes eventually grew into transistors, and the computer age takes off. And it all comes back. To this, um, to this error, right at the, at the beginning of all this, okay, um, and and that's how you know again innovation comes, you know, will spring from unlikely places. We want, but we want our, we want our error to be generative. We want our error to lead to something, right? Not just to make error for error's sake. Uh, we need to think about you know optimizing both for risk and reward in our innovation process, right? So we need to find ways to try a little risky exploration, right? We to to, to make to have some time to make mistakes. Uh, you know, this is sort of like the, you know, Google's 20% time sort of concept. We need some of that in our research labs as well. Uh, and we need to, you know, to question errors. When we see something that doesn't make sense, you know, maybe that, maybe that mistake tells us something else, right? Maybe you can learn something from somebody even when they're wrong. Okay, like the jerk at the beginning of my talk. Uh, you, know, you know, maybe that, that, that error allows you to think about something in a new way or to question an assumption. Uh, we want to pay attention to that. So some suggestions for uh, for the med audience. This isn't so much as a suggestion as maybe a little story, but uh, you know, uh, Reddy, you know, at all, um, you know, uh, was one of my my, my uh, folks at Fraunhofer presented a, a med approach for uh, for testing whether images that were input to an AI pipeline were adversarially modified, right? So these are images that are modified in order to trick the the, the underlying neural network. Um, and we had a testing approach to try to detect whether the the, the images were uh, were adversarial or not. Uh, and so we later on we took this concept and we were talking to a potential you know funding funding agent, 
and we, we presented the approach, right? And, and this person um, misunderstood what we were saying. So either we presented it badly, they misunderstood it, whatever it was, but they, the person said, you know, but that can't, you know, when, when the system is running, you know, it's at runtime and it's doing this and this and that, that, that you know, I don't understand how your approach works. And the fact is we, had, we hadn't thought about it as a runtime approach. We really thought about it as more of a traditional testing approach. Uh, but, but that error, you know, uh, we took that error back with us. We thought, hmm, how would we use this as a runtime approach? Why would we use this as a runtime approach? Does this make any sense? You know, what 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 are we doing? And and, and so my, again, my my question is just for all of us to think about this. Where else can we, you know, where else can we can we try new things? Where can we have more? Op what are the missing opportunities out there? So you know, this is one for us is that you know this error you know pushed us back to think about a new new way uh, to to use something in, in a context we hadn't thought about. Because there was there was an error in an understanding of what our approach originally did. Now we'll put this together with another concept called exaptation. Exaptation is a, is a term comes from evolution, uh, and and what it means is that you know some old structure, something that already exists, gets reused or, or or repurposed to do something different, right? To have a new function. And the classic example is the formation of, of feathers, right? Feathers start out, you know, the theory is they start out as as hair, they start out as fur, right? And, and over time, it gets a little bit thicker, it gets a little bit longer, it gets a little bit this, and you know, it starts to get firmer, you know, whatever. And, and all of a sudden, now you've got something that gives you a little bit of lift, so you can glide in on animals or something like that. Put that together with other changes in the skeleton, and over time, these you know, these things go from being fur to being wings that that, that give flight, right? But but the point is, during the process, the goal wasn't to get to a wing, right? The goal was, you know, the the the, fun the, the structure had a function. That it did well in that time, that function then got modified to do something else well, and then that got modified to do something else well. And you can see us moving through the adjacent possible, right? Arriving finally at something that gives flight to birds. So again, this notion of functional functional shift, you know, bringing ideas from other you know, other structures, other concepts, and and using them to push the the adjacent possible. So the scientist uh, Custler, Arthur Custler, writes, you know, all decisive events in the history of scientific thought can be described in terms of mental cross-fertilization between different disciplines. So again, I would focus us to, to try to bring, you know, bring more people into the, into, the, into the community with different ideas and different backgrounds so we can create new, new concepts. To give an example of this one, they, 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 he talks about the printing press. So um, uh, if you go back to uh, Germany, you know, before the 1400s, you know, um, Germany has got cold weather and it, it makes wine production a, a little bit difficult. But but vintners had understood, you know, people that make wine understood that you know a concept coming out of you know Greece and and uh, you know the Middle East or whatever of a screw press, which is used for to, to crush grapes, to crush olives, these kinds of things, to generate more you know more juice, uh, you know uh, that had been around for a long time, right? And and that screw press allowed them to allow the folks in Germany to to generate enough wine to be profitable. And Germany, you know, back in the 1400s, had about four times the the land area. Uh, um, in, in uh, wine production than they do now. And, it, and it's still a, a very strong wine producing region. So Johannes Gutenberg comes along and he was actually somebody who had, it was a failed vintner. He had tried to grow wine. He hadn't, he hadn't succeeded. And he took this, this idea, the screw press from this other area, other domain, and he brought it into this idea of developing the printing press. And so that screw press becomes the, 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 the one of the missing components needed to make the printing press. Uh, in fact, he, he stole lots of ideas, all, you know, Movable type, ink, paper, all of these things that existed, for example, in China, you know, for uh, you know, probably a thousand years at that point, right? Uh, but he was able to put all these things together and to create a system that allowed for the uh, very quick, rapid, you know, uh, printing. That then, you know, then really pushed the Protestant Reformation, you know, the development of Bibles, the democratization of knowledge, et cetera, et cetera. Massively important uh, idea that uh, that took off because you know, he, he borrowed an idea from somewhere else and put it to use. So chance favors the, the densely, the diversely connected mind. We want you know, interests outside, you know, interesting point. If, we, if, we, if you're interested in something that's outside the mainstream, if you care about like, you know, 13th century Persian poetry, um, it's very hard to find enough other people who care about that concept to help you work through it, right? So, so ideas need critical mass to survive, right? And so some studies here by Roy says diverse horizontal social networks three times more innovative than uniform vertical networks, right? So we're getting more people involved in all kinds of different cross pieces rather than trying to own the entire innovation process is more effective. It's really important though that we make connections between different contexts, right? We, we have, 
you know, it's not just enough to, to try lots of ideas that we already have. We want to bring new new ideas in because that's going to give us you know, new domains, new ideas, because that's going to give us the novel, interesting stuff that we, we couldn't see ourselves. So some suggestions uh, for Matt, uh, for example, going back to the story of, of Ready at all, you know, we, we took this this idea, this error and said, you know, how well, how would we use the metamorphic testing for use at runtime? And our, our focus shifted from traditional testing to thinking more about sensitivity, that metamorphic analysis gave us a way to push new inputs into the system and, and to see sort of, sort of slightly different behaviors of the system. We could use that to measure and track sensitivity. And that, and that was the signal we could use to get interesting new, uh, new approaches, right? So we, we, we realized we wanted to think, you know, not in terms of um, testing, but really to think in terms of input validation, right? So, um, you know, if you look at uh, typical database systems, they know you don't take user input and just operate on it because, you know, God knows what the, what the user put in there. Similar kind of concept makes sense for um, an AI pipeline, right? Why are we why are we operating on something that that you know data that comes from the user if we can't control it and understand what it is? We need to render it harmless or be able to make sure the system doesn't take action based on that. Okay, um, starting to get to the last concept platforms. So research platforms, you know, dramatically reduce the cons the cost of evolution. Uh, when I look at other some other fields, you know, some other testing fields and things like that, you know, they're using like SMT solvers. They're using other con, you know, uh, parsers, you know, compilers, other kind. They're using other concepts that make their research go faster. I don't think we have the same thing in the Met community. Uh, so research platforms are really helpful for this. They're, they're helpful when the ecosystem is dense when we, and we can share some common foundational activities. Uh, an interesting point: most of your, your your big winning platforms like the World Wide Web or something come in stacks, right? They, they, they allow us to take bits and pieces of functionality and combine them in different ways where the output of one process becomes the input to another. And we can just, we can mix and match these things to get all kinds of new and interesting concepts built. I'll tell you an example, how GPS came to be. So the Johns Hopkins uh, Applied Physics Laboratory, uh, uh, APL, it's a well-known government research laboratory. Uh, it was created in World War II to help with the war effort. In 1957, the, the USSR launched Sputnik into space, the first artificial satellite in the world. Uh, and they built it specifically to have a beacon, the Russians did, that would uh, let, let people know that the, the satellite was really up there in space. And they did it because they said, What's going to happen is that the, the, the West is going to say that this is all fake news, right? That it didn't really exist, okay? That, that this is all something we made up. So they put a beacon on it to prove it's really up there. Well, the folks at APL, they were, they were you know, very interested in this. So they, they put their radios out and they, they started to listen for this beacon. They say, okay, well, I know where I am. I hear the beacon. Now I can compute where Sputnik is. I know I have some energy on the beacon. I can tell where Sputnik is up in space. And then from that, they said, oh, that's interesting. Well, I can also account for Doppler shift and I can start to figure out where it's moving. And so bit by bit, they could, they could basically you know, uh, plot out the, the orbit of Sputnik. And this was very interesting to them and very interesting to the, to the whole organization. Well, as, as news of this came out, the deputy director of the organization called these scientists in to a secret office, uh, you know, uh, said, you know, I got a question for you. If we can do this, we know where we are, we hear the, the, the satellite, we can track its orbit. Can we invert the process? If, if, if I knew where the satellite was, but I didn't know where I was, could I turn it around so that, so that the satellite would, so you know, based on the signal from the satellite, I could tell where I am at any moment, right? And they actually wanted to do this for, um, for, for submarines to be able to target you know, missiles from, missile launching from a submarine where you didn't know exactly where you were. Well, anyway, the scientists said, you know, yes, I, I think we can do that. Uh, and so they got a lot of you know, support and funding and eventually the, the global positioning system was built that we all use today in our phones and things like that. Uh, and, and the interesting point is the platform here was actually the organization, Johns Hopkins APL. They had time, they had people, they had all kinds of, of, of skills and, and they could put these things together to solve a big problem. And, uh, and they had all the little bits and pieces together so they could quickly assemble a solution just to study this problem and then, and then take, it, take it further. So what, you know, what do uh, platforms and other research communities contain? You know, things like specifications of critical data, you know, models of, of key activities that are necessary to perform well, whatever is in the other community, software implementations for those key communities, open APIs, and also you know, methods for giving credit and support you know, to ecosystem builders, right? We have to think about those things. My suggestion for, for the, the metamorphic testing community is, what, what would our platform be, right? What, um, what should we have, right? How can we work together uh, and, with, and, and build some common infrastructure that would make it better, cheaper, and faster to design, build, and evaluate, you know, uh, net applications and research and things like that. 
And it, you know, these are just some examples, data sets, you know, MR creation tools, instrumentation tools and metrics, design patterns, challenge problems, competitions, for example, maybe we could take something like the AI or the open AI five, uh, you know, gaming, you know, platform and where we have AI in there and try to, you know, uh, figure out what could, could we do you know, to a system like this, that'll be a, that'll be of interest and value. All right, I'm sorry. So I ran a little bit long here, uh, but I'm going to start. I'm going to wrap up here and open up the, the the floor to some questions. So this started for me with an overheard conversation, right? You know, me and the jerk hanging out, um, and 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 raising a question for me: Is our community really as successful as we'd like it to be? I think it does good work, but how can it be more successful than it is today? One that pushed me to look a little bit, you know, for this and other reasons. Well, where do good ideas come from, right? We need to focus on, on non-obvious, low-hanging fruit. We need to build diverse social networks. We need to play more, try more things, welcome mistakes. We need to have a better, build a better ecosystem, and we need to default to openness and work together. Uh, some ideas for collaboration and moving forward. You know, I think if we want to grow our, I think we should all want to grow our community. But we need to broaden. And, we need to grow our, bring more people into the field broaden and deepen our ideas and demonstrate our impact. And, and we need to work together, right? We need to generate creative, bizarre ideas. You know, we need to develop infrastructure and push our ideas, you know, not just within our community, but out into other communities as well. And so I'll, I'll wrap up here now with um, just a, a call for greater collaboration, right? If we want to raise the profile and success of our community, we need to work together. We need more people, more ideas, more successes. So thank you very much. And I'm well happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Adam. It was an impressive presentation. A lot of food for thought. Uh, uh, I really like how you combine the, this general innovation uh, concept with very specific actions, which was fantastic. I mean, I was writing all the time like crazy because they are really interesting ideas in there. Uh, OK, uh, for the audience, please, guys, remember to write your questions in the chat, and we will ask those questions verbally, OK? Uh, well, we have a reflection from Alastair Donaldson from the Imperial College. He says, uh, well, probably you, you can read it. Uh, Thank you for the wonderful talk. Different metamorphic testing works often have a lot in common conceptually, but may have very little in common when it comes to nitty gritty details. For instance, the format in which a test input is provided or the nature of a test output may vary dramatically between domains. For this reason, I have been a bit cold on the idea of trying to build common infrastructure for metamorphic testing. Any thoughts on how best to approach this? For example, find large and old niches such that building niche-specific infrastructures pay off? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> I think uh, that's a great concept, but I, th I think it actually calls out a couple things. One is, um, we we have this this um, threat of being too narrow, right? Of being too of being um, one of the one of the complaints that people have is that we're not generalizable enough, and it's exactly for this reason because these MRs are very specific to to a particular domain. Um, so so probably that's not the you know uh, that's probably not the place where we can be to have the most commonality. But for example, you know if we came up with some domains like AI, right? And again, I'm pushing this AI concept. What what can we measure in a net, in a neural network? What could we, you know, how might we create MRs in a, in a neural network? Some of these, maybe we can get a little bit out of the domains. I mean, by, by the way, we don't have to do only one or the other. We can we can combine things. But if, if we want common common infrastructure, it's going to have to be um, on some things that are common, right? So maybe we need to identify domain verticals. Say, okay, well, within the you know AI domain, we do this, and within you know some other domain, we do that, right? Um, but it can also be things like domain specific languages for generating MRs. A, you know, API standards. There could be some other places, <clears throat> you know, where we, we could uh, see some value as well. But it's a, it's a great, it's a, it's a challenge, right? Okay, thank you so much. Um, Sia Jan, could you please mute yourself? I think they are noises. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, well, I couldn't agree more with you about the bad reputation of metamorphic testing for, for a long time. Actually, that's something that we have uh, talked about openly in the workshop uh, many times. We, we all have had experiences like the one that you were mentioning before. Uh, just to give an example, a few, uh, a few days back uh, in the keynote by Mark, uh, by Mark Harman, he was presenting uh, this application of metamorphic testing in Facebook, which is really great. And I remember that someone in the audience asked, uh, why calling it metamorphic testing? Uh, shouldn't we call it magic? Uh, so still, people is really reluctant to, for some reason, 
to to accept metamorphic testing despite the many many interesting applications out there and despite the applications the large scale applications in, in companies like google um, and facebook uh, so my, my so, question yeah. my question is how Good. do you why do you think that it's so difficult to convince people of the value of metamorphic testing is it the simplicity yeah, yeah. Oh, watch well, in, in some ways, I think our, our examples have been too simple. And, mm -hmm. and you know, we've come up with, you know, we've come up with these great examples just to, to, to explain the concept. And then people say, oh, well, then that's all there is to it is just these examples. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think, you know, one thing, of course, you know, I mean, there, there, are many, there are many issues here, right? I mean, I think, you know, I, I, I didn't see Mark's uh, keynote. I hope he pushed back against the, 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 the point because it's lazy. It's lazy to say something is, you know, uh, is magic or it's no good or whatever, right? I mean, it, it's just an easy, um, you know, easy, simple, you know, uh, irony that people go for. So that's that's a problem. But I but I, I think to some degree, fighting that directly is the wrong approach, right? I think the way we have the way we get acceptance is through more success, right? So every time someone like like Mark Harmon gets up and says, "At Facebook, we're doing X," when we're using metamorphic testing concepts. We need to trumpet that, right? We need to we need to lead with the positive uh, examples because because you can't really argue with with that, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you can argue, you know, maybe it's you know maybe it doesn't have enough you know ma uh, ma mathematical theory or, or whatever, <clears throat> but you can't argue with with the actual use. So we need to capture and document success, and and, and you know, we, and our websites should 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 talk about this, right? Should push these things. Um, and, and I think, again, the way, the way uh, you know, it's not just us, right? I mean, you know, I've, you know, I've seen this in many different fields. So for people that aren't old enough, you know, databases was considered just the most useless, you know, this is going back to the 70s. It was just considered a useless field, right? And, and eventually, you know, uh, COD came along, came up with a relational, you know, it was SQL and, and relational database model, et cetera, et cetera. And then it just took off, right? Uh, AI went through what they call AI winter. You know, I used to, I used to, when I was in graduate school in, in the 1980s, I, I made fun of my AI colleagues, you know, to my shame. I made fun of them because I'm like, that stuff will never, ever work, right? <laughs> and they said, no, you watch, you know, in, fi in 50 years, we'll have self-driving cars. I'm like, oh, yeah, sure, 50 years, right? Well, in fact, it only took about about 25 years, right? Um, and and they were right. I was wrong. Okay, so it's it's very easy to to you know to pick and, and, and choose, but you can't argue with success, right? No, none of us now say, oh AI, that's some some stupid magic, right? I mean, we we actually have to respect that you know they've they've made amazing strides, right? And they're and they're and they're having success every day. So again, the way to do this is for us to focus more on practical problems and get the word out, and eventually you know people will have to come along. And, and then again, some of these folks, you know, the guy who says, you know, oh, it's just magic or whatever, we're probably never going to convince that person, right? They're 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 kind of lost. <clears throat> but but the thing is, you know, how do we get the new the next generation of young people coming out to see, wow, you know, this stuff is being used at, at Facebook, this stuff is being used at Google, this stuff is really interesting. You know, we need to convince those those young people, right? Not not some of these old old curmudgeons who can't, you know, they, so saying in English, you, know, you can't teach teach an old dog new tricks, right? Um, you know the way the way scientific revolutions will happen, right? Is by providing value and letting and, and having the young people come along and see that, and then they they pick it up and they run with it, and then it's no longer a question. But it's it's, it's anyway it's a it's a great it's a great question, great observation. I think it's unfortunate that that uh, some people are, are behave that way, but the, but the, the the path forward from us is not to fight them directly. It's to have more have more success. Yeah, well, I totally agree. Let me remind the audience that in one minute and a half the the clouder will we will cut off the the connection. If you want to continue discussing with Professor Porter, you will see a pop up in the in the screen with a link to a discussion room. Please click on there, and well, if I, if Professor Porter is uh, kind enough, he will stay with us uh, a bit longer to to continue the discussion. Uh, well, I have just a very Quick final questions. Most papers on metamorphic testing, uh, Adam, are about applications of metamorphic testing. Uh, my question is: Is that the right direction? We, we should we focus on a specific applications, or we should try to push a bit more the foundations of the technique? What do you think? Well, I, I think you have to do both. <laughs> okay, you have to do both because because the um, you know I, I think the applications is a very nice way to get other domains involved in what we're doing, right? 
But I think I'll, I think you know we uh, we also need to have, for example, this 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 notion of building building infrastructure and a platform. That's more likely to come from people who are interested in the foundational concepts. We want to support that. Um, you know, the other thing I think we want to also be thinking about is, can we take some of the concepts we have and import them into other fields as well, right? So we don't want to just be a community that talks to ourselves. How do we reach out, you know, and and have an impact in in another field, right? And, and, and again, that, that notion of that little game that I was talking about, well, where would metamorphic concepts be useful in requirement specification, right? I mean, just, just pick something, right? And, and you know, again, have, have a little 